for, well, no, he's not anymore. He was preaching for the Salem Church of Christ in Glen East in West Virginia when this book was published, but he has moved to Florida, and he continues his teaching duties at West Virginia School of Preaching over the Internet. We're thankful, very thankful that he was willing to do that. He is a treasure to us, and we love him. Emmanuel. If you haven't seen Michael Forche with a red nose on, uh, you should see him that way sometime. He is a pretty good comedian. I don't know about how he preaches. <laughs> uh, let's see. Last night I had a gaffe when I was making announcements, and I said it was 1915. And everybody laughed. Well, I got up this morning in the prehistoric ages. We had no lights. And so we were in the dark, just like they were in 1915 and other places. So I wasn't too bad, far off. I am glad to be with you. I really am. This is, uh, well... I do not have a place to preach, and I, to be honest, I don't intend to get a place to preach. I would like to preach on a part-time basis if I can find some uh, small churches around the area that need fill-in preaching. I have uh, filled in at uh, one of the churches in the northern Daytona area uh, already, and so I hope as I'm, I get better known, that I will have more opportunities to preach and teach. I uh, am glad that I am able to speak to the students by Skype. Uh, I, I would rather be with them in the classroom. It, I think that it's much more effective and, uh, and we can communicate better. Uh, but uh, I am glad that I am able to do what I can. I miss my friends up here. Uh, and Bruce and I have been away two weeks already. We've been in gospel meetings down in central West Virginia. So uh, I'm ready to go home. And uh, though home is now Florida, my home is where my wife is. This uh, is the 21st chapter in the lecture series that began in 1995. Actually, it, the lectures actually began in 1995. We didn't have a lecture the first year simply because we were just getting started. But uh, I am glad for the legacy that this lecture series has uh, has been we have chosen a, a bible book nearly every uh, year that we have had the lectureship and if you have those lectures throughout that 20 year period you have a rich treasure of knowledge by good brethren who are have been very good bible students in this area and other places from which we have invited guest speakers. And so treasure those books. Uh, pass them on to your children. Read them and study them, and you will grow in your Bible knowledge. I'm glad that we're studying the Psalms. I just hope that I live long enough to finish them. <laughs> Since we do them one every other year, uh, it's going to take about five years or six years to get them covered or more. My task this hour is to address the text of Psalm 71. Brother Franklin Camp, a man who had good influence on me, I believe, said that if you want to learn how to worship, read the Psalms, study the Psalms. Uh, if you want to have the attitude of worship, study the Psalms. 
And as we have gone through these psalms this week, it has been a real uh, pleasure to me to see the emphasis on the praise, adoration, exaltation, and worship of Almighty God. The great expositor of the Psalms, Charles Spurgeon, said of the 71st Psalm, Throughout this psalm may be regarded as the utterance of a struggling but staggering faith. This is a psalm of a man who has reached advanced age, like many of us. And uh, he records that from his birth and through his youth into his old age, he has loved and served Almighty God. But now he is facing challenges from enemies. It's amazing to me how many of these psalms we have dealt with this week that uh, talk about the enemies. Now, in this particular psalm, we don't have an author identified. Uh, this is not recorded as being a psalm of David. And uh, there is no more ancient information given about the psalm. And so who these enemies are, we're really not sure. It could be a psalm of David, but it could be a psalm written by another person. Some of the psalms are anonymous, and I believe this to be one of those type of psalms. Uh, Brother Roy Deaver calls this a psalm of life, and it is a psalm that gives us energy and life as we read it, as we acknowledge what the psalmist is going through. Uh, I want to give you, my psalm, by the way, has to do with endurance. I want to give you a living example of endurance. When Bruce and I were preaching down there in central uh, West Virginia, Bruce was at uh, Upshur County at Buckhannon, and I was at uh, Barber County, at the Union congregation out in the country. But uh, Brother Roy Pratt had been up to Weston for a gospel meeting. Brother Pratt lives in Kentucky, and he drove all the way up there by himself, preached the meeting, went on home. Well, Brother Pratt is only 97. I think that's endurance. That's an old gospel preacher that is still fulfilling his duty to God and loving what he does. Brother Pratt was uh, converted by, I think, baptized by Brother Cunningham of the Chester congregation uh, many years ago. And so uh, it's always good to hear about him and know that he is still doing well. The, uh, there are six points that I have made out of this psalm, Psalm 71. And uh, the first section, verses 1 through 6, tells us that help and trust are factors in having endurance. If we're going to, uh, to have endurance, then help. We need help from others. We need help from God. We need to trust in God. In the second place, only with God's help can one endure against his enemies. If you've got enemies, then God is the one that is going to help you to endure. Verses 7 through 13. Hope and praise are to be continuous. And the person that hopes and praises will depend upon God's strength then to endure, verses 14 through 16. Then in the fourth place, a cheerful soul endures. Point number five, the goodness of God brings endurance, verses 20 and 21. And finally, worship, thanksgiving, praise and song uh, to God 
rejoicing that he has endured with God's help, verses 22 through 24. He begins by saying, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. When you think about it, from the Christian standpoint and from the standpoint of a person who is a believer in God, Jehovah, uh, who else could he put his trust in? Our problem in our modern world is that we put our men, our, our, our trust in men. We, uh, we depend upon machines and technology. We put our uh, trust in armies and military alliances. We put our trust in politics and science or philosophy or perhaps man's celebrated ingenuity. But it is God alone who is able to provide the strength and the help that we need if we are going to endure. I was impressed in uh, J.D.'s lesson last uh, hour in reading through uh, the words violence, violence, violence. I think three times the word violence is used we live in a violent world. Just before we left to come up for our gospel meetings, there was a, a, a road rage thing down there in Florida. A man with three children in his pickup truck uh, passed another car and the fellow thought that he cut him off too soon. Well, they got into an argument as they are speeding down the interstate. And the man that uh, thought that he was uh, uh, infringed upon pulled out a gun and started shooting at the cab of that truck. Well, a little four-year-old girl was shot in the head and killed. The police caught the man and he has admitted to what he did. But what a terrible world we live in when people cannot control their, their emotions and their passions any more than that, that they have to take out their violence on innocent children and innocent people. I've been driving on our highways a long, long time. And I'm sure that I have cut people off. I'm sure that I have done something that has provoked another uh, driver. And without doubt, and I admit that sometimes I have been provoked, but road rage, chasing somebody down, shooting at them, threatening them, Righteous people don't do things like that. We need to keep our emotions under control. When somebody does that to me, if there is no contact with my automobile, I just, I'm glad I wasn't hurt. I'm glad he wasn't hurt. If he keeps driving like he is, the police will stop him sometime. Put those kind of things out of your mind. Don't let these kind of things take over and control your life. Oh, Lord, I put my trust in you. It reminds us of what Peter said in the New Testament when Jesus taught those hard things in uh, John chapter 6. Lord, or he, uh, Jesus asked, will you two go away? And he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. When we think in, uh, in spiritual terms and along spiritual lines, when we are thinking of salvation and eternity, when we are thinking of the things that uh, make for peace and goodness among men, where else can we go? The old song that we sing, Where Could I Go But To The Lord? Certainly, we need to 
to remember that God alone is the one in whom we put our trust. Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know that uh, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. There is a way that seems right unto a man, Solomon said, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah 10.23 and Proverbs 14.12. When we rely only on our human devices and our human resources, then we are going to fail. God alone is the one to whom we can put our trust. He further petitions God in this section to deliver me in your righteousness. He refers to the righteousness of God in verses 2, 15, 16, 19, and 24. I came to the conclusion that basically what the psalmist is talking about when he is uh, mentioning the, his deliverance by the righteousness of God, that he is referring to his, what the New Testament refers to as the grace of God. Without the righteousness of God, no man could know no man could come to a proper conclusion about the things of life that uh, have to do with eternity. And so deliver me in your righteousness. Only in the righteousness of God can we have deliverance. Uh, but uh, there is a recent commercial that's been on TV this fall uh, that man is the author of his own fate. He talks about uh, the line from Invictus, I am the captain of my soul. What a fool any man is to think that he is the captain of his soul. Didn't he hear Jeremiah? It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. God is the one that we put our trust in. It's because of his righteousness that we can do that. He appeals to God as his strong habitation, his rock of refuge. And Bruce, I was telling Bruce at lunchtime that uh, in nearly all of the Psalms, again, that we discussed, have been discussed through this week, several have uh, pointed out God as the rock of and the refuge, the rock of my salvation, the refuge of my soul. God being the rock and the refuge, that's where we hide in the cleft that was riven for me. We need a place where we can find shelter in the time of storm. Life can be very, very harsh. Disappointments can be so, so devastating. Somewhere, every day, there is somebody that is filled with heartache and heartbreak. They are devastated by bad news about health or bad news about a family member or someone who has given up on Christ. The saddest thing of all. But we need a place of refuge. And God is that place of refuge. How important it is that we see Christ as the rock of our salvation. Jesus told the story of the two men building their houses. One built his house on the rock and it stood against the ravages of wind and weather. The other built his house on the sand and 
the Bible says, Jesus said, great was the fall of it. It wasn't just the fall and the collapse of a house. It was the fall and the collapse of a soul. When a person loses their soul, they have lost everything that has any value as far as this life is concerned. In verses 4 through 6, the psalmist appeals to the Lord for deliverance out of the hand of the wicked, the unrighteous, and the cruel man. Again, we do not know who these enemies were. Uh, but without a doubt, he is feeling the very vulnerable to their accusations to malicious words and threats. He confesses that God is his only hope and points out that he had, has been sustained uh, through, his, uh, from, through his life from the time he was born through his youth and into his old age by Jehovah God. In the deepest recesses of his memory, he begins to pull out things that uh, that he knows how when God helped him and was protecting him and assuring him and encouraging him. He said that he would continue to praise him. Uh, continually is stressed in this psalm again. When the, uh, when the psalmist speaks of God and the goodness of God toward him, the endurance that he has sustained because of it, he, he shows that it is continual. It began early in his life. He has had that assurance throughout his life and into his old age. He knows that God is with him. What's that line from Amazing Grace? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will bring me home. We don't do it on our own and I'm not at all saying that it is by grace alone. But please understand, without God's grace, there is nothing And so he says, only with God's help can one endure against his enemies. In verse 7, he said, I have become a wonder to many. This word wonder uh, is the word mopeth. I have no idea whether that's a right pronunciation or not, but it is mopeth, M-O-P-E-T-H. But it is... Uh, a rare word in the Old Testament. Nearly half of its occurrences in the Old Testament refer to the plagues of Egypt. And here is this old man now saying that he is a wonder to many. This would suggest that uh, through his lifetime, many things have happened to him with God's help that cause him to know that God is with him, and thus he is a wonder. Uh, turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. I think we have an example of that in uh, Joshua 2. You remember the story of Rahab and the spies? And she had uh, uh, brought the spies into her place and uh, in verse 8, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. 
and that you did what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Zion and Hog, Og, um, whom you uttered, utterly destroyed. Now notice, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Rahab and all the citizens of Jericho were very, very much in wonder and awe of the children of Israel as they journeyed from Egypt across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And now they are ready to come into Canaan. And so for 40 years, they have been seeing and hearing God's wonder. This word mopeth means wonder, sign, or portent. The crossing of the Red Sea was a portent to Jericho. The deliverance through the battles of Israel in the wilderness were a portent. They were a sign. They were a wonder of what God could do and would do if Jericho resisted. Uh, on the psalmist, of the psalmist, one has written uh, that it is implied that his life was a public life, such as that of a prophet or leading man amongst his people, or it would not have attracted the notice and excited the wonder of many. And so here is a man who is a walking wonder that God is using to, uh, to show his wonder to men and women. Because of the many wonders that Jehovah had brought upon him, through the years, he says, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Charles Spurgeon said, uh, what a blessed mouthful. Uh, the, uh, in verse 9, we learn that the psalmist is an old man, and he prays that the Lord will not cast him off in his old age. Uh, he says... <clears throat> That he is, uh, uh, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. I have come to find out in the last few years that uh, old age has its own set of problems. There are things that I never was afraid of that I don't care about now. When Joshua Hetrick put the roof on my house up here in Wheeling five years ago, it didn't bother me a bit to get up there and scrape those shingles off and just jump and dance around all over that roof. But my balance isn't what it was then. I try to jog and I start going blah, 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 blah. Solomon describes the weakness of and the frailties of man in Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. But how fearful life can be when you, when you are not able to, uh, to, to stand and perhaps get out of bed and you start lunging away that you don't want to go. <laughs> or your eyes are not as good as they used to be. Or your hearing and you get half of a conversation, and that's all mixed up, too. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, God is the keeper of the aged, and uh, he is the keeper of all men through the ages. The collusion of his enemies has increased his danger, and his age prevents him from defending himself. And so uh, 
he, he cries out to God, Be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, verse 12. Life can get pretty bitter when friends and helpers and others that you have depended on have, uh, have forsaken you. Uh, and so uh, may all of us remember, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. As an aside, we need to be mindful to honor and respect those men and women who are in their advanced age. The law of Moses said, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man, and thou shalt fear thy God. I am Jehovah. Leviticus 19 and verse 32. Now we see an older person walking down the street, and here comes a gang of young men uh, pushing them out of the way or uh, ridiculing them for not walking faster or uh, just just ignoring them or uh, wanting to push them out of the way. Second uh, Kings 2, 34, or 23 and 24, when the she-bears came out of the woods to maul those young men who uh, made fun of Elijah, or Elisha rather. Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. But they are the ones that got roughed up. Hoodlums have been in the world, I guess, since the beginning of time. We ought not to be surprised that they are still with us and still dangerous people. And so the danger of the psalmist seems to be immediate. His desperation sh shows through when he says, Oh my God, make haste to help me. And so there is a, a twofold imprecation here. Uh, number one, to invoke evil or a curse upon these wicked men. He prays that these adversaries to his soul be confounded and confused. Or as the American standard says, ashamed and consumed. He is asking that their plot against his life be refuted and disgraced. And let them be covered with ro reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. He pleads that he might be in God's hand of mercy and that the enemies might be under God's hand of judgment. Uh, in uh, verses 14 through 16, he says, But I will hope continuous, continuously and praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. I like that statement there. Your, uh, I will make mention of your righteousness, your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. The, the blessings of God are numberless. We sing the good song, Count Your Many Blessings, and I think that we ought to try. But I believe that a verse like this tells me that there is no end to the blessings of God. There is no end to his mercies and the things that he has in store for those who are the righteous and are living out their life uh, in, in his care and keeping. Uh, <clears throat> Rather than continuing uh, in a state of distress, he says that he is going to worship God more and more. We find ourselves, when we hear bad news, kind of get into a depression, into a, a, a state of mind where we just have no interest in anything and we kind of uh, back away from life. When this happened, when these things were happening to the psalmist, 
he didn't go into depression. He went into a state of higher and greater worship and praise. I was telling a relative of mine recently who had was uh, in a state of depression. I said, worship God. Be faithful in your service to the church. Sing about God. Pray all the time. Don't let yourself get depressed to where you are backing away from God, but rather make yourself in a state of mind where you are going to him more and more and relying upon him and putting your trust in him. We can't give up on God, but so many seem to do so. Christ, uh, the church of Christ, should be praying daily for strength to do what God's will for their, the work of the church is uh, to do that. In spite of the railing of people against Christ and against Christianity and perhaps even against uh, faithful servants of the Lord individually, in spite of these things, this ought to make us want to worship more and more rather than giving up. What are we going to do? with the atheists and the humanists and the politicians and the judges who seem to be working against us on all, every side. Are we just going to cave in? Are we going to just uh, fall into a cocoon of some sort and hope that maybe it'll get better someday? It may get worse. I don't see the things in our political system and in the our courts of the, our land changing for the good at any time soon, do you? We need to stand fast. We need to hold our ground. We need to continue doing the work of the church, the work that Christ has assigned to us from 2,000 years ago. We need to go into all the world preaching the gospel. We need to be teaching our friends and our neighbors. We need to go uh, along the hillsides and the country roads. We need to go to the streets of our cities. We are not evangelizing like we once did in the, uh, a, a few years ago. If you want to get out of a funk, if you want to get out of depression, then you do more work. It will bring you out of it, and it will make you uh, worthwhile in the kingdom. A cheerful soul endures. In this section, the psalmist continues his praise to God and recalls how God has taught him from the days of his youth. We're not left to wonder how the psalmist was taught throughout the Old Testament, especially in the early chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. It tells of the duty of parents uh, under the Old Testament to instruct their children when they rise up and when they sit down and when they go to bed and uh, when they walk during the day. And it also tells of the, the duties of the priests of the Old Testament that were charged with teaching God's word and of prophets who would uh, be God's special messengers giving their message of uh, uh, to avoid sin and return to the law, all of these things. In the Psalm 119, wherewith, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 12. In his advanced years, when he is old and gray-headed, he declares God's wondrous works. He prays for the Lord to preserve him until he is able to declare his strength to the next generation. 
That's what I want to do. I want to declare the Lord's strength to the next generation. That's what our preaching school is all about. Declaring to the next generation. The words that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will teach others also. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. Paul in his sermon to the people in Antioch of Pisidia spoke concerning David. He said, for David has... Uh, David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption, Acts 13, 36. This reminds us all that this, our own generation, the one we live in now, is the time that we have to tell the message. I can't tell people that have already passed. They may have been told but I can't ever tell them again. I can't tell people who are yet unborn that I have never met, that I will never meet, but I can tell my generation. The goodness of God says that, uh, that will, the goodness of God will bring endurance, 19 through 21. Oh God, who is like you, your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. All things in heaven and earth sing the praises of Jehovah. Read Revelation 4 and 5. Things in the earth and things under the earth. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of uh, <clears throat> the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. And finally, uh, worship, thanksgiving, and song, praising God that he has endured. Verses 22 through 24. Also with the lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O God, my God. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you and my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. For they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. Uh, he said, I will praise you, I will sing, my lips shall greatly rejoice, my tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. Now, look at verse 1 and verse 24. Verse 24 says, they are confounded for they brought to shame who seek my hurt. In verse 1 he says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Who ended up getting put to shame? The enemies, the ones that tried to destroy this old man. Those who are saved are those who endure. Those who endure have done so by his righteousness, by his grace. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Perhaps you are present this afternoon and not yet a child of God. I pray that if uh, that be the case, that you will uh, want to serve God, that you will want to be faithful like this old psalmist in Psalm 71. Read that psalm over again and see how determined he was and how, uh, how he wanted to endure to the end, to be God's servant. If it be the case that you need to be baptized into Christ, confessing your belief and trust in Jesus as the resurrected Son of God in repentance of your sins and yielding yourself to being baptized for the remission of your sins, we would invite you to respond to the invitation. If you need the prayers of the church on your behalf for uh, things that, uh, uh, in which you may have fallen short of God's glory and his will for your life, we urge you to respond as we stand and sing.